thank you very much. Uh, of course, many words were said about Krzysztof over those days. Let me add a little bit of my part. Um, so uh, my uh, intense interaction with Krzysztof started many years ago uh, at the Schroeder Institute. So that time um, they separated desks by huge plants and I was sitting across a plant from uh, Krzysztof and it was always possible to reach out and uh, he spent, uh, how I estimate it now, enormous time teaching me various things, kind of explaining to me his, uh, his work with Antti and other stuff. And uh, well, of course, I learned a lot of physics and math from him. But I, I think from um, big personalities, you, you learn not necessarily like technical things, but um, the way how to think about uh, physics and math, the, the way how to think about life, how to be uh, persistent, how to have an independent opinion. And okay, many of those things I tried, maybe without success, to learn from Krzysztof, I think, Part of it was successful, part of it, and part of it I probably failed, but certainly I'm very grateful to him for his time and uh, um, his contributions and his patience. Maybe I was not a very good student, but well, we both tried our best. Um, so in particular uh, today, uh, the topic that I want to talk about uh, that's a mixture on the mass side, that's a mixture of uh, Hamiltonian and hyperbolic geometry, and it is motivated by some recent progress in physics. So my hope is that uh, Krzysztof, if he were to attend such a talk, would like it. Of course, well, now, difficult to say, but at least that's, that's what I try to do. We'll see how it works. So it's a joint work in progress with Eckhart Meinrenken. So this progress part, perhaps you will see um, in some of the um, in some of the slides. Right. Let's see. Okay. Hmm. I know. Right. That's one of the first tests for the speaker. Well. Technician, okay, thank you. Uh, right, so I start with the physics motivation. So there will be two parts of the motivation. One part is, it comes from physics, another part comes from mass. And the physics motivation is related to recent progress in the so-called jekyll teitelbaum gravity. So there are many versions of uh, gravity, classical and quantum in two dimensions. So this is one of them. And uh, here is the uh, action principle uh, for, um, for this Jakiv title bohm or JT gravity. Uh, so, sorry, there was a question? Okay, so uh, here is the action principle which depends on two fields. One of them is a Riemannian metric on a two dimensional surface and another one is a scalar field. And up to boundary terms, which are very, very important, the choice of boundary terms is very important, but I don't want to make it precise on this slide. It's an integral of the scalar field times uh, uh, the uh, uh, curvature of the metric plus a constant. Here I chose this constant to be plus one. In general, this is the cosmological co constant of this JT gravity. And uh, as you s easily see, the early Lagrange equation uh, one of the early Lagrange equations for this model is that uh, the curvature is equal to minus one. So in other words, the classical solutions uh, of this model are hyperbolic metrics on your surface. And that's, that will be, uh, that, that's how the hyperbolic geometry comes in. Now, uh, so this uh, recent progress, in particular, there are many things uh, which, uh, which are done, but one thing is an observation of some kind of duality between 2D and 1D. So duality is a physics word. In mathematics, it probably means equivalence. 
So uh, there is uh, a duality, let's call it like that, for now, between this two-dimensional theory and a theory which is one-dimensional. It's called the Schwartz and theory. So there our space-time is S1. Now let me illustrate it by choosing a very simple geometry. We're gonna revisit this geometry several times today. It's just a disk and uh, so, uh, what the, at least what the physics papers are saying, that we're looking at the surface which is also topologically a disk, but where the boundary can be wiggly. So you see this red line, it tries to illustrate uh, this wiggly boundary. It carries, uh, again, the physics talk says, some degrees of freedom which are described by the action written below. So that's the action of the Schwartz and theory. It's a kind of strange beast. You see what, I, what, what we saw on the previous slide was really rather conventional field theory. So this one is strange. The main object is a diffeomorphism of the circle F. So you see this uh, F of X plus two pi is F of X plus, uh, let me see. Now the second piece of equipment, I'm failing again, right? I don't know whether you see this green. Uh, so so, so, so this, this is a diffeomorphism of the circle, F prime must be positive. And then uh, the action consists of two pieces. One piece is a sort of kinetic term and the other piece is this uh, complicated expression which is called the Schwartz and derivative. So for this reason, uh, this theory is called the Schwartz and theory. I am not completely sure about my coefficients. Probably on the next slides there will be some contradiction with it. I tried to correct it, but my tablet did not connect to your system. So, okay, let's leave with approximate, approximate coefficients. So, uh, one of the uh, purposes of this talk is to give uh, some mathematics interpretation of part of this picture. So that we'll, we'll see towards the end of the talk. But that, that's my first motivation. There is this uh, interesting observation. There is a theory of hyperbolic metrics on two surfaces. And then uh, it is sometimes equivalent to some complicated, interesting, a little bit esoteric theory at the boundary. Now let me pass uh, to a mathematics motivation. And this goes under the name of Hamiltonian geometry. So this is a very beautiful and by now rather standard piece of mass. So here is a definition. Suppose you have uh, a manifold M together with a two form on M called omega and together with an action of a group G and uh, a function, a map from M called mu to the dual of the Lie algebra. Right, so there are many pieces of uh, information and this is called the Hamiltonian G space if it satisfies several axioms. Here I list those axioms because later on we'll, we'll basically, I, I'm not gonna repeat the definition, we're gonna do it in the infinite dimensional context. So first of all, M omega is symplectic, so omega is non-degenerate and closed. Then there is a moment map equation uh, meaning, meaning that if I substitute a fundamental vector field for some element of Lie algebra of G into the symplectic form, I get a Durham differential of the pairing of the map mu with, uh, with this element X. Or in other words, this function mu X is a Hamiltonian for the uh, vector field XM. And also sometimes people add this condition and I, I gonna add this condition. The moment map is equivalent under the action of the group on the manifold and under the quadjoint action on the dual of the Lie algebra, right? So this is a, a complicated definition, many elements and many axioms which uh, bind them together. However, this is a, an extraordinarily successful definition. Just uh, to give you an impression, I would like to remind you of four major results or major themes which, uh, which are consequences of this definition. First of all, there is uh, probably the most used in the literature, I guess literally there would be like thousands of papers about it. Uh, there is a construction which is called reduction. You take a fiber of some point 
mu minus one of psi and you divide by the coadjoint stabilizer and you obtain a new space which may be manifold or it may have some singularities but this gadget is symplectic. So this is the uh, Marsden-Weinstein theorem and kind of probably now every year uh, there are many, many papers about different aspects of this construction since about 40 years. Uh, so the other statement is convexity. If you take the image of M under mu and divide by the coadjoint action, you get a convex uh, polyhedral cone or polytop depending on the context. Of course, here I would need to make more assumptions on G. Maybe we don't dive into it, but that's also a very beautiful and very and somewhat unexpected geometric aspect of the story. So then there is a uh, localization which says the following. If we try to compute an integral uh, of with a Liouville measure of the exponential of the moment map, so this integral can be computed explicitly as a sum of a fixed points of the maximal torus action on the manifold. Of some localization contributions, I don't want to bother you with writing down what they are. This is some kind of uh, multidimensional analog of the residue formula. So you, yeah, it's exact, right. So the, uh, the right hand side is exact and actually we're gonna revisit this formula towards the end of the talk in the infinite dimensional context. But yes, uh, uh, like the original, maybe I should uh, say that the original formula of this type was invented by Deustermatt and Heckman and that's exactly some kind of, sorry for repeating words, exact uh, uh, steepest descent or exact stationary phase formula. Um, so, um, but, and then it was uh, understood on a more conceptual level, this localization by Ber independently by Berlin and Bern and Dati and Bott. And uh, finally, the fourth big result is a so-called quantization commutes with reduction principle of Gilman and Sternberg. Here, let me not, again, let me not dive into it, but like each of those uh, four statements here, it's a big chapter in the development of uh, mathematics over the last around 40 years. So, uh, okay, uh, because it's so successful, people were very interested how to generalize it in various directions. Of course, one question you can ask. Uh, so in here, it was, everything was finite dimensional and there were restrictions on the group and on the manifold that I didn't mention explicitly. Uh, so my one question is, can you do it infinite dimensionally? And of course, you can. There are many works in that direction. Let me focus on one particular infinite dimensional version which uh, started maybe about 25 years ago and here, the group which acts will be uh, the loop group of your finite dimensional group. So the maps from, from the circle to the group and it has famously a canonical central extension uh, by the circle which I denote LG hat and that's this guy LG hat which will be acting on an infinite dimensional symplectic space and the moment map here if you analyze the, uh, the situation so the, the good model of the dual of the Lie algebra is a space of one forms on the circle or connections on the circle. So uh, it was Mein Rankin and Woodward who started this uh, program 25 years ago. And by now, basically the whole Hamiltonian package, everything, all those four statements uh, that I listed in the finite dimensional case, by now, uh, they are, they are they worked out. I mean, there are some outstanding problems, but by and large, it's done. Uh, and sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's highly non-trivial how you generalize the statements. For instance, here I said uh, in localization, you need to compute some integrals. What are those integrals in the infinite dimensional case? So that's an, a non-trivial question to be answered. And, but this is, this is basically all known in the case of infinite dimensional, in, in the case of loop groups. And maybe just one thing that I want to point out and it will help us later on. So here is an example. Suppose we have a surface, again, with a boundary similar to the picture we had in the JT case. 
And here is an example of such a Hamiltonian space for the loop group. So you can see the now the space of uh, connections uh, on your surface. You want them to be flat, so FA is the curvature of the connection. And you divide this space by the gauge action of the gauge group with a special property that uh, the gauge transformation, this G, it's equal to one at the boundary. So this would be an example because the residual action of the gauge transformations, which is not, which are not one at the boundary, it give, give it will give rise to the action of the of the loop group. And it's interesting that the moment map in this case, that's really easy. You take this connection, you restrict it to the boundary, right? The boundary in my example is a circle. And right, and I said before, the target of the moment map, this should be connections on the circle. So that's, that's exactly how it works. Okay, so, um, but today I gonna speak about something else. So that's one natural example and people explore it in, in great detail. But then uh, there is another natural example which for some reason didn't get that much attention in the Hamiltonian geometry mass literature. And uh, these are Hamiltonian actions of the central extension of diffeomorphisms of the circle, right? If you want to, to choose some kind of tame infinite dimensional group, typically you have two choices. It's either the loop group or diffeomorphisms of the circle. These are your first candidates. And uh, that's, that's the candidate that we consider today. So uh, diffeomorphisms of the circle also poss possess a canonical central extension. Uh, so this central extension is described by this bort verasoro cycle, right? Probably many of you know that if you want to define a central extension, you need a cycle. If I want the cycle with values in S1, I need to exponentiate it. So, and this would describe the, the product of two diffeomorphisms, the central part of the product of two diffeomorphisms. Now, uh, on the technical level, and for our purposes, it will be a little bit more convenient instead of diffeomorphisms of the circle to work uh, with the universal cover because the universals of the circle contract to S1, so it's not simply connected. And uh, so here, this group, uh, diff tilde, so that's a group of maps from R to R, which are quasi-periodic and have positive derivative. So this is the universal cover of diffeomorphisms. And of course, you can, you can pull back the central extension. So there is a central extension, which I'm going to call G. So that's going to be our group that we plan to study. And we want to look at uh, Hamiltonian geometry for the action of that group. Now, the uh, Lie algebra of that group is vector fields on the circle plus there is a central line corresponding to S1. And what is perhaps uh, more interesting or more relevant for us today, the dual, that's not the topological dual, so-called smooth dual, is uh, the space of uh, quadratic differentials on the circle. So these are gadgets of this type, plus a real line, the dual to this guy and usually the coordinate on that line is called the central charge by analogy with conformal field theory and we denote it by C. So maybe just a small comment, right? There is a, an obvious duality between vector fields and quadratic differentials because a vector field is D over DX, quadratic differential is DX square. You divide DX square by DX, what remains is DX. So the product is naturally one form on the circle. You can integrate it and get a number. So that's the duality. Now, uh, these two objects, uh, it is convenient to combine them into the second order differential operator. So C, second derivative plus T of X. This is called in, in the mass literature, Hill operator. In the physics literature, probably Schrodinger operator. So a second order differential operator on the circle. And you see, we're gonna assume from now on that C is non-zero. So this theory is very different for C equals zero and C in C non-zero. And for us, it will be interesting to consider C non-zero case. And in most cases, you can just scale it to be one. So, okay. 
Now, what I'm going to show you are two examples of uh, Hamiltonian, or two families of examples of Hamiltonian spaces for this group. So one of the, uh, or maybe, sorry, yeah. So maybe first let me outline some useful facts about the quadrant action and about heel operators. Well, since I said that the model of uh, the dual of the Lie algebra, uh, that's quadratic differentials, you may ask what's the quadrant action? And the quadrant action looks a little bit interesting and surprising. So we have a diffeomorphism, uh, a coordinate change f, and we have a function t, and the quadrant action maps it to uh, the function t composed with f, that's not unexpected. It is multiplied by the square of the derivative. It's also not unexpected because it's a quadratic differential. But then there is an extra piece, which is c over two times this uh, Schwartz and derivative of f. And maybe just to, just a quick reminder, the Schwartz and derivative has the following two interesting properties. It vanishes on uh, Merdell's transformations, and it has this, this kind of composition property, right? So you, you, you have this, sorry. It has this composition property, and because of that composition property, the formula above is an action of a group, right? It's not kind of obvious why it would be an action, but, but because of this formula, it's an action. So um, another, another remark is a piece of geometry. Heel operators, so those second order differential operators, well, sorry, I really have a difficulty in operating this device. So second order differential operators, they in one-to-one -one correspondence with geometric structures on the circle, which are called projective structures. So what is a projective structure? So a projective structure is a local diffeomorphism from uh, your manifold, in this case your circle, to the projective space. In this case, of course, the projective space is RP1, so it's a very easy one. And how does this correspondence go? So you take your differential equation and you solve it, right? We know it typically has two solutions. You can choose these solutions to have Ronsky and equal one, and then the map would be a map from x to the ratio of u1 of x and u2 of x, and this defines for us a point in RP1. And it turns out that this is a one-to-one -one correspondence, a projective structure defines for you uh, um, a heel operator and the other way around. And note that the choice of such solutions, well, sorry, okay. So the choice of these solutions is up to Merbius transformations, right, for the ratio. So that will be also important for us very soon. Okay, so now I go back to my examples. So I will present for you two families of examples one old and one new, and in the end I will tie them up. So the first example are so-called Verisoro quadrant orbits. So these are simply the orbits of the action, of the quadrant action that you see on the top of the slide. So the classification was worked out over the years. Uh, I think the first paper that we know of is Lazutkin Pankratova in 76, and they didn't know about any quadrant orbits. And then it's Siegel, Kirillov, Witten, and then many, many other papers. So there is a lot of literature where people work and rework this classification. Sorry that I, I don't list all of them. There are many, and there are many important contributions. But here, here, here is how it looks. You see, it's, it's a kind of sophisticated picture. So the horizontal line up there, these are the orbits which pass through t equal to constant, right? You pass through a constant and you operate by diffeomorphism on it. So each point of this line is an orbit. So uh, among those points, there are some important ones. One of them is zero. Then another one is this c over two, and in general, c over two times the square of an integer. And then there are other families, right? You see there are those vertical lines, and there are points which uh, stand there separately. 
right? So each of the points, each of the black points, either on a line or standalone, corresponds to an orbit. So of course this, so this picture here indicates that the quotient, the space of orbits is not Hausdorff. Uh, so now maybe let me say a little bit about the words. Since we have a second order differential equation, it has a monodromy for the pair of solutions when you go around the circle. This monodromy is a two by two matrix. It can be hyperbolic and uh, this happens here for negative t and also on those mysterious vertical lines. It can be elliptic, this happens on the right of zero in the intervals. It can be trivial and then you get those red points and it can be parabolic and then you get those standalone points. In the literature, so there is a lot of literature about this problem and like grand majority of the literature is focused on this one point. So this is called the Teichmuller orbit because this is a so-called, uh, it embeds naturally in the so-called universal Teichmuller space, which knows about Teichmuller spaces for all genera, and it attracts attention of people in mathematics from different fields. So, so this, this is maybe like in some way the most important orbit, and that's the only orbit with a stabilizer being PSL2R. So then, of course, there is a complete classification of stabilizers here up on, on this horizontal axis, it is S1, here it is R plus, and there are more complicated stabilizers for other points. So these are examples in the following sense, the moment map is identity, and there is a unique, for each, for each orbit, there is a unique omega which makes it, unique symplectic form which makes it into an example. Okay, so that's something which uh, was developed before. And another example that I want to present to you today, and that's basically uh, our main result. So these are modular spaces of hyperbolic metrics. So here is a picture. We are, we are back to our friend, a two surface, the, to simplify things, we choose it to have one boundary component. So sigma bar is a closed surface and its boundary is isomorphic to S1. And a bit, sorry for like kind of uh, a little bit clumsy notation, sigma itself, this will be the interior of that closed surface. So I first include the boundary and now I exclude the boundary again. And you will see why, just because of my definition. So uh, the space M that we want to define is a space of hyperbolic matrix on sigma, on the interior. Uh, and those metrics, they explode as one over y square at the boundary, where y is some boundary defining function. So I try to illustrate it with a picture. So you have here some local chart, some yellow chart with coordinates x and y, and y square times g, this would be locally a metric on sigma bar. So that, that, that guy goes to to a limit, to a finite limit when y goes to zero. And similar to the example of uh, Mind Rankin and Woodward, we divided by diffeomorphisms of the closed surface, which are equal to one at the boundary. Now you can make a choice. You can either divide by the connected component of diffeomorphisms, and then you get as a result some kind of infinite dimensional uh, manifold. Uh, or you can divide by all diffeomorphisms, in, including the mapping class group, and then you get a more interesting space, but it will have some, some kind of singularities. So maybe for, to simplify things, we're gonna, we're gonna think about the connected component of diffeomorphisms, and note that again, we have an action of diffeomorphisms of the circle, which is the uh, quotient of uh, all diffeomorphisms of sigma bar, by diffeomorphisms which are one at the boundary. So at least we have an action on, on that space of our uh, diffeomorphisms of the circle or of the universal cover. Now here is, um, here is a theorem. Uh, so this, uh, this M is a very thorough Hamiltonian space and uh, I should give you two elements, the moment map and the two form. Let me show you a little bit how it works. So first of all, the moment map. 
uh, we have this hyperbolic metric, and I, here I draw only the color near this boundary at infinity. By the way, so as, uh, as we learned, in hyperbolic geometry, people, of course, studied those so-called hyperbolic ends. There are the whole books about it and about spectral theory on those hyperbolic ends. And um, so in mathematics, they are called funnels. And the physicists, they invented their own word. They call such things trumpets. I guess that's because of the shape, right? It's some kind of, uh, you, you have a thin neck or maybe not a very thin neck, and then it explodes at the infinity. So it does resemble a little bit of a trumpet. So, uh, okay, so here the magic of hyperbolic geometry kicks in. So I draw here two charts, uh, a pink chart and the yellow chart. And on each of those charts, you can choose coordinates, x, y, or x prime, y prime, and bring your metric to the standard form of the hyperbolic plane, half plane. So then uh, on the overlap, the transition function between these uh, two, uh, two charts would be necessarily a Möbius transformation, right? Because we know the, uh, th that these are the only transformations which preserve the uh, hyperbolic metric on the upper half plane. And this means that if we restrict those transformations to the boundary, we're gonna have some atlas at the boundary with transition functions being Möbius transformations. And that's another picture for a projective structure on the boundary. And we said that projective structures on the boundary, that's the same as uh, Hill operators. So now we can reconstruct by a Hill operator and that's the moment map um, for this space. Now, what about the two form? Actually, I was a little bit hesitant whether, whether I want to, to give you the, the construction of the two form or not. And in the end, I decided I will show you some half truths. So, um, so the idea is as follows. So we have a hyperbolic metric, and here comes the more or less standard construction people use, uh, in particular in description of uh, gravity. <coughs> so for your metric, you choose an orthonormal coframe, alpha one, alpha two. And then by the Cartan moving frame formalism, there is a unique spin connection. In this case, this is a one form omega. Sorry for repeating, uh, repeating the notation for the symplectic form, especially on the same slide. But, uh, but, again, but this omega, it's not the same as that omega. So sorry, sorry about trying to make you confused. So there is a unique spin connection which satisfy the Cartan's moving frame equations. <coughs> and then if G is hyperbolic, it's equivalent to the following expression. So alpha one E1 plus alpha two E2 plus omega E3 to be a flat SL2R connection. Here E1 and E2 are hyperbolic generators of SL2R and E3 is an, is an elliptic generator. You can choose them in different ways, but that's, that, that's how one needs to do it. So then there is famously uh, in gauge theory, the formula due to Atiyah bot, how you build a two form on the space of connections. So, and that's the formula that I show you below, that's the Atiyah bot formula. Um, it's, uh, yeah, that, that's the formula which is used when you want to define symplectic forms on moduli or flat connections. And here it, it's, it's, it's perfect, the only thing is, if you look at it carefully, on the collar near the boundary, the connection A blows up as one over Y. So in the integral, a priori, you have uh, something like dy over Y squared. So this integral diverges normally. However, it turns out that there is again some magic of uh, hyperbolic geometry, which makes it converge in this case. So maybe this part, unless you ask me, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you how, how we look at it, how we do it, but it turns out that this is a symplectic form and together with mu that I described here in a somewhat more elegant fashion, so they make a, a Hamiltonian, Verasor Hamiltonian space. Okay, so far so good. Now I uh, want to 
so th that's, that's basically the result that we have at the moment. There is another result that I'm not going to show you, and instead I want to discuss some perspectives, uh, some conjectures and open problems, <laughs> which will actually link the two examples and which give uh, interpretation of the 2D, 1D uh, duality that I mentioned in the beginning. So first of all, so our examples up to now are Verisora co-joint orbits or moduli of hyperbolic metrics. Now, um, already in the uh, paper of Sarge, Schenker, and Stanford, which pioneered JT, uh, recently pioneered JT um, gravity, so they more or less say, let's say our interpretation is that the moduli space of hyperbolic metrics corresponding to the disk is isomorphic to that orbit. Remember, there was, there was this uh, big red point, the, the Teichmüller orbit, the most important orbit in the classification. So, uh, so they should be, uh, those spaces, they should be isomorphic. And yeah, maybe there are still some small things to check, but, but it's, it's very, very probable that it is true. Now, um, what about other orbits? So here is a sort of very convincing, very probable conjecture. Suppose now that you take a disk, and in the disk you admit a conic singularity inside. So a conic singularity is characterized by the angle uh, when you go around that point, right? If it's a conic singularity, that angle is not equal to two pi. It's different from two pi. And here is a well-justified conjecture that if you consider uh, moduli of hyperbolic metrics with one conic singularity somewhere on the disk, then you get, um, you get an orbit where T would be given by this expression C over two times alpha over two pi squared, whatever, some quadratic, simple quadratic function of the angle. Uh, but now we assume that alpha is not equal to two pi n. Now what if alpha is equal to two pi n? Here is the next level. This conjecture is, well, sort of probable, but one should still figure out what this conjecture means. So let me first state it and then explain the, the, the difficulty. So the moduli of uh, um, hyperbolic metrics with a conic singularity where alpha is equal to two pi n, right? So you have a huge, huge angle when you go around that point. So it's isomorphic to those special orbits, t equal to c over two times n square. But here one should probably modify the equivalence relation. You see my equivalence relation here? We were, hmm, we were supposed to divide by diffeomorphisms which are equal to one. And most probably you can add more things. Some of the transformations, some of the equivalences by which you need to dif divide, they are probably not diffeomorphisms. They have some kind of singularities. That's where you want to move the singular, this, this, this singular point to another place. There you would need to do something. Uh, maybe I just uh, briefly go back. I briefly go back to the classification. So that's the picture of the classification. And basically uh, those uh, conjectures, uh, they're suggesting that all these orbits on, on, on this line, they admit some explicit, in the physics language, duals, or they admit explicit isomorphisms with uh, spaces of hyperbolic metrics with singularities of different type. Of course, what remains to be seen whether all the orbits admit something, some, some kind of interpretation. At the moment, uh, we don't know that, but um, here, like I, I put a question mark, so maybe there are some still some spaces of hyperbolic metrics on the disk with further singularities which would correspond to orbits of other types. Uh, but that's, that's really a speculation. Here, I, since I, I don't know which, uh, which moduli space one should look at, but hopefully we're gonna learn it soon, whether it works or not. 
So that was um, an interpretation, our take at the duality that people see in physics. And now maybe another set of uh, conjectures and open problems, right? I, I listed great properties of Hamiltonian geometry. And in the case of, in the case of uh, Vera Soro, um, so reduction probably works. Convexity is probably not that interesting because it's some kind of rank one case. For, for a moment, I don't adventure to quantization commutes with reduction. What about localization? So uh, in, in the physics literature, people without much hesitation compute integrals of uh, those moduli spaces of hyperbolic metrics using the Duster and Hackman localization. And in particular, uh, there, are, there are papers of Stanford and Witten which use the, this Duster and Hackman technique. Now recall, Dustermatt Hackman is telling you that this is exact stationary phase. Uh, of course, if your integral is Gaussian, then you're sure that the stationary phase will be exact. And one possible approach is to look for global Darboux coordinates on, on those spaces. So if you have global Darboux coordinates, even if your space is infinite dimensional, you still get a, an infinite dimensional Gaussian integral and there maybe you can negotiate. So may, may, maybe this is really well defined and you get your answer. So uh, for those hyperbolic orbits with t smaller than zero, uh, we've just submitted a paper to the AHP issue uh, dedicated to, to Krzysztof, which shows that it works. And in the physics literature for surfaces of genus greater than one, uh, there is a technology which probably can be made work. Let me finish with a completely open question. Recall, right, return to the big red point. So the Teichmuller orbit, the orbit OC over two, which corresponds to the disk. So th that's the easiest geometry on the hyperbolic metric side. And that's the most important uh, quadrant orbit. Um, all indications go in the direction of having global Darboux coordinates. However, it's absolutely not known how to build them. And well, hopefully, hopefully in the near future, there will be either some obstacle or maybe construction, I don't know. And that's probably, um, so the, the chair already showed me some small number of minutes. Okay, thank you. Who was Hill? Why should one call uh, one dimension a Schrodinger operator by <laughs> another name? Yeah, I, 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 to be honest, I don't quite know. The, the paper of Lazutkin and von Kradova was entitled on the property. So I think ver, 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 versant deformations of Hill operators. So yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, uh, I probably should look up on the Wikipedia, but uh, just like that, I, I don't know, but it's an old name. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, another possible name would be Sturm Liouville operator. Sure, sure, of course. Hello? Yeah. Um, what, I'm, I'm curious. Hello, I'm Hi. Um, what, what is the moment map in the infinite dimensional case, not in your specific example, you just one circle at the boundary of the moon. If, if you have several. Circles. Oh, oh, there, there will be several actions. Several actions. Yeah, for each. So uh, yeah, each that's, that's 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 similar to gauge theory. Yeah, you can. I I was drawing surfaces with just one boundary component, just to, to simplify our life. But in general, there would be uh, an action of several copies of diffeomorphisms for each boundary. There would be uh, its own copy. Could you be please? Could you please be a bit more explicit about this Duster-Mathekman theorem in the infinite dimensional case? What what are the the, the the integrals that you are able to compute? 
uh, following uh, return and system. Uh, and, uh, right, the, the, there is kind of, there, there are several approaches, right? <coughs> there is a formal approach. The formal approach tells you, uh, so you have your simplex space, you have uh, maybe, now, now I try to present how it's done in uh, Stanford Witten paper. So you have an S1 action, you look for fixed points. It turns out you have only one fixed point. So at, this, at that fixed point, you are trying to define your localization contribution. So the localization contribution consists of the numerator, which is the exponent of the moment map. With that, there is absolutely no problem. And then you have a denominator, which is a Pfeiffian of something. Pfeiffian now of some infinite dimensional operator directly doesn't make sense, but you can introduce a convention say that this is a zeta, zeta regularized Pfeiffian, then it does make sense. So you have some formal right-hand side. Of course, difficult to say whether it corresponds to any integral, but uh, the right-hand side of the dussermatt hecken formula with this zeta regularization prescription makes perfect sense and it can be computed. Now, um, my point was that Suppose that your space actually admits global Darbu coordinates. In that case, you can try to define uh, a dussmatt hackman integral. So this would be some kind of Gaussian integral. Gaussian integral, well, then, of course, depends a little bit how precise you want to be, but Gaussian integrals typically even in infinite dimensions, uh, if, uh, if the exponent, if, if you have uh, uh, a good uh, kind of, with a good sign, a quadratic form, they are sort of defined and you can, you can also define them in that case. So uh, the comparison shows that the answer seems to be the same. Now, um, but, but this is, but this uh, Darvu coordinate story covers only, only some part of the space of orbits. In, in other cases, uh, I don't quite know. Maybe I should also, I can also add that this Samson Shatashvili, we looked at it from a different perspective. We looked at the Virasoro characters. Virasoro characters are, of course, very well defined, and in a certain limit, Typically, the characters, they should reproduce orbital integrals. In this case, one can try to define such a limit, and with some, let's say, uh, with some further details, it basically gives the answers that, that, that are obtained from, uh, from the form of Dustumot-Heckman integral. As far as I know, that's where it stands. So there is no, like, very good answer to your question. That's why I'm speaking for so long time. Just a remark on uh, Jan's question. Hill's equation comes from Hill, who in the 19th century studied the motion of the moon mm -hmm. with respect to the pre-body problem in the gravitational field of the Earth's sun. So, so it's very fitting, first of all, 19th century and gravity. 